Uh, welcome to um, our session today. Um, so this is our third webinar series. So today our topic is on AVNRT. We have two um, presenters with us today, Dr. Amir from Malaysia, IJN, and Dr. Wan Yong from Samsung Medical Korea. And the two uh, doctors with us as our panelists uh, Dr. Pipin from Indonesia and Dr. Kelvin from Singapore. Actually, Dr. Kelvin is from my lab. <laughs> we work together. So um, sometimes we overrun. Um, we will just start with the first speaker. Is that okay? Mr. Okay. Amin, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see uh, the slide? Eh? Um, not yet. Okay. Can we see the PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. 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 I just start with the intro and start the preparation uh, slide. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Okay. My name is Amir Zwa from IJN uh, EP Cardiovascular Technologies. Okay. From this morning session, I will present you about basic maneuver in SVT. Is it uh, with the uh, AVRT and AVRT that one to help the uh, light health professional what they need to observe during the procedure? Okay, usually patient uh, we send for EPS uh, usually have something that reason the reason thing to put them on the table to put the wire. Okay, usually patient coming with uh, ECG in tachycardia. Some patient is uh, narrow but irregular, but we don't go for three wire EP study. For for example, like this case, we have a narrow regular ECG tachycardia. So this ECG maybe can be uh, AVRT or AVNRT. And some patient with extra data from the referral letter may be terminated with adenosine. So doctor, we suspect this one is a uh, accessory pathway. It can be AVNRT or AVRT. Okay, here. Uh, placement of the catheter. In our center, we only use three catheter, CS, HIS, and RV. RA is just like the optional. Okay, okay, we skip. Okay, here is baseline ECG. Uh, when we, uh, in our center, we use the uh, HIS, RV, and CS. Okay, uh, first we put the ECG. On ECG, PQRS. So, must be tally with the RV electrode signal is under the QRS. For the HIS signal, you must have the sharp HIS signal and the big V on the HIS channel. And compared to the CS, you must have the big A but the small RV. This one is the uh, proper position of the uh, catheter. If you find that you cannot find the sharp HIS, so that means you need to reposition the catheter until you got at least the his signal before we start the maneuver. Okay, uh, for the his, you must be early to the QRS to exclude the WPW. For uh, WPW, we tend to get the negative HB, but for this one, the HB is ahead of the QRS, so that means this ECG not a WPW. Okay. Okay, we go for the next slide. Okay, here's a basic measurement of HV interval. During the baseline measurement, the most important thing is HV interval. As long as pre and post, you get the normal uh, HV interval, so you are safe from the complete heart block. But if you tend to get prolonged uh, dissociate HV interval after the ablation, so that means patient tendency to get the AV node disease or complete heart block. Okay, first. Usually to induce the tachycardia, we have uh, three uh, protocols, uh, three basic EP protocols. So first is documented pacing. So we start with pacing at uh, maybe uh, 400 uh, milliseconds. We start to deck down uh, by 10 milliseconds until uh, when kebab or ERP. Okay, extra similar is just uh, drive uh, eight bit of uh, split, uh, 400 drive and then with one extra stimulus or two extra stimulus. And then it's a burst pacing. Burst pacing is like the ICD burst pacing. Okay. Here, uh, okay, next is ventricular pacing. Okay, 
during uh, before we start induce the tachycardia first thing we need to do is uh, do the v pace maneuver okay here on the ecg uh, we see we pace from the rv when we pace from the rv we need to capture the rv once we capture the rv we need to see the conduction on the cs Okay, what the operator need to know when we do the V pace is, is it concentric activation or eccentric activation? Uh, concentric activation means no, uh, we can exclude left-sided pathway. Okay, from this uh, EGM, what we can exclude is uh, left-sided pathway, but still we can have a possibility of right-sided pathway or LVNRT or atriotechy because we only do the ventricular pacing okay next this one is a uh, different okay this one we still pace at the ventricle capture the ventricle and then see the conduction on the cs okay the conduction on the cs is eccentric because the uh, earlier activation from cs12 and then the latest conduction is 19 so this one uh, we can say is left sided conduction so with this V pace, we already can exclude two uh, possibility diagnosis, left uh, right side the pathway and AVNRT. So uh, our option maybe we can go for left sided pathway. Okay, maybe we got intermittent right sided connection here because eccentric, eccentric, and next V pace is concentric activation. Okay, next is during V pace again we pace the ventricle, but is it any relation to the A? No, because V, A, V, and no A, V, A, and V dissociate. So with this kind of V, A dissociation during V pace, we already exclude the AVRT. We already exclude the pathway, but still we can induce the AVNRT or atrial tachy. Okay. Okay, here. The first maneuver. Uh, protocol is documental pacing. During the documental pacing, we need to pace the atrium. Here we use uh, CS910 as a atrial pacing. By pacing at the CS910, we need to confirm is it A capture or not capture by seeing all A EGM in the CS7856. So based on this intracardia, we saw that by pacing at the 910, so we capture the A, but is it conduct to ventricle? Yes, A pace and V is captured. So that means it's there in one-to-one -one conduction during when, uh, when keep, uh, decremental pacing. But at some point here, we see at 240 milliseconds, it start prolong and when keep up here. And then the next bit conduct to uh, to perform to induce the SVT tachycardia during the maneuver, we need to make sure all the pacing is conducted to ventricle. When you cannot uh, conduct uh, to the ventricle, that means you impossible to induce the one-to-one -one, uh, tachycardia conduction. Okay, for this example, so by doing decremental pacing, uh, we hope that during this period of wanky bar, we stop the atrial pacing and hope conduction will conduct to the accessory pathway. Okay, next is extra stimulus. So extra stimulus means uh, drive, uh, drive at the A1 and A2 as a premature conduction. Okay, here we paint at the CS910, we see the conduction A to V, A to V, and then here the last is A2. A2 is A to V. Okay, usually for inducing of tachycardia after conduction, the last bit of premature, we can see any retrograde or re-entrant conduction after the, the last premature bit. So for this one, just conduct to the V and no other re-entrant. Same, after complete the A1, A2, proceed with A1, A2, and A3. Okay, A1, A2, A3 means one drive for 15 milliseconds and two of premature bit for this case a to v a to v and start with a to v and premature one premature two so here we see still cannot induce the tachycardia but during the 
extra stimulus, we need to make sure all the conduction is conducted. Once uh, there any ERP, we need to stop the maneuver and proceed with other maneuver. Okay. Okay, here. Let's see. Same like uh, returning uh, extra stimulus. A to V, A to V, A to V, and A to V. Usually this question, is it this conduction towards to this conduction and make a re-entrant tachycardia or just ERP on the last bit and causing a returning junction. So this one, if you think this a jump conduction, so you need to prove by what is a jump. Okay. Or if this is ERP and then you need to start to change your method of maneuver. Maybe after the command of A3, start the command the A2. Okay. Is it ERP jump or just a returning junction? So to prove it, is it jump or not, we need to perform an extra stimulus. Okay, first, uh, this extra stimulus uh, 450 and 270. By measuring the last premature bit, A to B is uh, supposed to be measured A to H. But uh, sometimes we cannot uh, properly see the H, uh, H, uh, H signal. So we go for ventricle. Okay, for this one, uh, I just measure the ventricle. From the A to the V is 186 millisecond. So then... The next uh, step of a extra stimulus, 450 to 50. Previous is 450 to 70. Okay, during 450 to uh, 50, so we see that after the last premature bit, the last premature bit to the conductor is 256. 256 minus with 186 is more than 50 milliseconds, and we so here the start of one to one tachycardia. Okay. So what is AH jump? Okay, by definition, AH jump is uh, with 10 millisecond decrease in extra stimulus, the AA interval, coupling interval, there is more than 50 millisecond increase in AH interval. Okay, in other words, this one uh fast pathway ERP. Okay, during a normal conduction, the conduction from the SA node goes to AV node. Uh, goes to fast pathway, but block in slow pathway conducted to his parking and ventricle. What happened during AVNRT? Okay, during AVNRT, the conduction from the atrial goes towards to fast pathway, but ERP on the fast pathway conducted to the slow pathway goes down to ventricle at the same time conduction from the AV node retrogradely at the fast pathway goes to the uh, atrial and again uh, repetition of the conduction and causing repetition on the AV node that cause the AV and RT. Okay, here uh, on the diagram and the picture how to differentiate between normal conduction and slow pathway and fast pathway conduction. Uh, the first diagram is, okay, we see the something, this one is the slow conduction, uh, slow pathway conduction as one fast pathway conduction. Okay, during the normal sinusidum, the conduction from the SA node goes to the AV node, but it goes to fast pathway towards the ventricle. What happened to the slow pathway? The slow pathway is being blocked it's in RP in uh, slow pathway. So we cannot induce the tachycardia. So jump, the uh, definition of jump is when the fast pathway is blocked, the conduction is go through the ventricle towards the uh, slow pathway. But this one still we cannot induce the tachycardia because no retrograde leaf to the fast pathway. Okay, the third picture is the conduction to the fast pathway is blocked. But slow pathway take over to the ventricle and cause it another retrogradely fast pathway to the atrium. And then when this fast pathway conduction goes to the atrium, it will continue the re-entrance of tachycardia from the uh, retrograde from the fast pathway and integrate to the slow pathway. Then uh, this cycle will continue until it's terminate, uh, self-terminate or terminate with something. Okay. 
on this side there is a difference between uh, AV and RT connection and AV RT connection. AV and RT connection only evolve somewhere around AV node. It's no need the atrial connection or ventricular connection or another accessory pathway. But in AV RT, uh, it needs the atrial side. AV node side, ventricle side, and pathway. So by understand this simple diagram, uh, it will tell us how we got the value during our entrainment. Okay, in AVRT. Yeah, we have five minutes left. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. Okay, in AVRT, okay, this are two type of. AVRT. AVRT is antidromic tachycardia and autodromic tachycardia. Okay, antidromic tachycardia is uh, integrally for, uh, to the pathway, but autodromic tachycardia integrate to the AV node. Okay, okay. On the tachycardia, uh, what we see on this tachycardia is uh, HV uh, positive HV and concentric activation. So with uh, this uh, tachycardia, we uh, already can exclude this, uh, we already exclude VT, we already exclude left-sided pathway. It can be AT or AV and RT. Uh, but compared to this activation, still VA one-to-one -one connection, but we see that one-to is early compared to 19. So this one is eccentric uh, activation of tachycardia. So with this kind of tachycardia, we uh, excluded the right uh, sided pathway and uh, AV and RT. So every tachycardia, we need to start with maneuver to differentiate. Is it AV RT or AV and RT? Okay, first thing we need to do the VESD. Okay, during VESD, the most important uh, result we need to know is it advanced or no advanced. So when we say no advancement, so we excluded the pathway, but if uh, advancement, that's a pathway. Okay, so to do the uh, VESD by putting single premature beat during the tachycardia, we need to see the response. Is it advanced or not advanced the atrial channel? For example, for here, uh, regular narrow complex tachycardia with one-to-one -one conduction, but after given the premature beat, it still remains the same of cycle length of atrium. So that means it's not advanced the tachycardia. So we excluded pathway here, but we still can go for AT or AV and RT. How, uh, why is it, uh, some VSD advanced and not advanced? Uh, because during uh, premature PVC, we can see uh, every PVC we still need to collide with the AV node conduction. So it will be difficult for the PVC to enter the atrial region to advance DA. But in uh, AVR team, even PVC given uh, we stimulate the VEST, the connection will go along with the pathway and advance the tachycardia. So we will see advancement of A during tachycardia. Okay, entrainment. Okay, after complete the VEST, we already uh, know is it pathway or no pathway. Usually for uh, no advancement in uh, VEST, we start with the entrainment. So for doing entrainment, first thing is we need to measure the cycle length. And then the second is we need to pace the ventricle faster at least to 20 millisecond or 30 millisecond to the uh, tachycardia second length. Okay. After we pacing the ventricle, first thing we need to observe is, is it ventricular capture or not first? And then second, is it the atrial is follow the pacing second length or not? If uh, atrial follow the pacing second length, so that means we already entrain the tachycardia. Next thing is post-pacing interval behavior. Is it VAAV or VAV? If uh, we saw the uh, post pacing response is VAAV is a AV, uh, AT, arterial tachycardia, but if behavior is VAV is a AV and RT. For some reason, uh, uh, there is a maneuver PPI minus TCL. Is it more than 115 or less than 115? Is it uh, post pacing long or short? 
Okay, what's this one happen? Because during the ketika dia happen, for example, we took for AVNRT, the reentrant only around the avion, and then we reset the ketika dia at the RV, so it's very far to the circuit. Once we stop the resetting, the ketika dia will resume back, and then time from the ketika dia goes to the RV ketika it takes some times. So that's why in AVNRT we get a long post spacing interval compared to pathway because in the pathway the, we need the ventricle involved in the tachycardia. So uh, after resetting the connection during the tachycardia will go along to the RV and goes up to RA. So the returning uh, pacing to the RV signal is near. That's why we got the PPI uh, post pacing is a uh, short in AVRT. Okay, this one just flutter entertainment. Okay, flutter. Okay, okay. On this one is a special case. Okay, for some patient, uh, after fix the CF and RV, we saw the behavior of this. Uh, is it like a dissociation at the first half of the tachycardia? It looks like a flutter suddenly after premature beat comes in. The tachycardia become one to one conduction. So what happened on this EGM? Okay, uh, when we do the plotting, we see VA during conduction is uh, equally uh, VA during tachycardia and dissociate one. But after PVC comes in, the tachycardia back to one to one conduction. Okay, this is what we call feeling effect. During feeling effect is altered. Uh, the refractory uh, in the parking G that uh, will uh, adjust the refractory and conduct the tachycardia back to one to one. Okay, for example, from okay, this one is part of the tachycardia uh, down to slow pathway up to fast pathway and then conduct the ventricle and then for the second time down to slow pathway conduct to his and block in the parking G system at this causing the 2 to 1 or lower common pathway block. But after PVC comes in here, it altered the refractory on the parking G and causing the conduction can slip through the parking G and goes to ventricle. Okay, we put at the EGM. Okay, from this EGM, here is dissociate, but uh, V2A is consistent. Okay, V2A consistent, this was, uh, means VA consistent, and then PVC comes in, miss, and then 1, 1, 1. So that means after that PVC is goes to 1 to 1 conduction. What happened here? Okay, uh, in the, in the uh, lower common pathway block, the refractory is slightly longer compared to the uh, normal 1 to 1 SVT conduction. So here, during the dissociate, the refractory on parking G prevent the conduction from the AV nerve goes to ventricle, but allow retrograde to the atrium. And second bit also. And for the third bit, the fourth bit, when the PVC comes in here, it block the next uh, conduction, but uh, after that, uh, no more refractory on the parking G and then the connection from the AV node can slip through to the ventricle with a, a new designated of refractory in the AV node, in the parking G refractory. That's why we call the peeling effect. Just appeal the refractory and make it a normal uh, refractory period then allow all the conduction, one-to-one -one conduction during the tachycardia. By seeing this uh, EGM, the uh, the operator already can exclude pathway and atrotechy on this EGM because of dissociate here means you already exclude pathway. Pathway need the atrial and the ventricle. Here we don't see atrial and ventricle relationship. So we exclude the pathway here. So the only involved is uh, AT or AVNRT, but because of PVC comes in, altered the refractory period and change to one-to-one -one conduction. So we already exclude the atrial because 
based on this maneuver, it involves somewhere around AV node and his region. Okay, so by knowing the site of ablation, and then we we'll, uh, leave it to the operator to go for ablation. Sorry, oh. um, maybe we'll give you uh, one last minute to finish up everything. Okay, so in the summary, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so in the as a summary, um, to go for AV and RT, first we need to have the uh, during uh, VESD, we need to have uh, no advancement during VESD. That one is the first. And then second, when you do the entrainment, the behavior must be VAV. Also, we have the post-passing interval, a long post-passing interval. And then for some cases, what happens if termination during uh, entrainment? So that one also we can include, add, uh, include as a sign of AV and RT. Uh, okay, I think that's all for my 15 minute presentation. Thank you, thank you. That was excellent. <laughs> I, 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 we, all of us uh, in the panelists, we appreciate the challenges of covering such a heavy subject within that 20 minutes and we really appreciate the hard work <laughs> on the slide. So thank you very much. Uh, okay. I think, yeah, uh, maybe I just want to point out a few points for the uh, attendings that I think you touch on many, many, many uh, EP maneuvers, which is really crucial. But uh, maybe I just mentioned a few points. I, 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 one of your slides mentioned uh, uh, ventricular atrial dissociation during V pacing. And uh, there was a suggestion that maybe there is uh, no uh, pathway. I just want to caution that one of them, sometimes this pathway comes on with isoprenaline. So sometimes we repeat EP testing with isoprenaline is important. I think that's important for the uh, attendings to note and I think we also stress a lot on concentric activation but I was I also want to emphasize that not just concentric activation but concentric decremental activation that excludes an accessory pathways that's also important and I think on the atrial stimulation side we emphasize a lot about the ventricular response but I also want to caution the attendings that you also should look out for QRS changes that sometimes may suggest some changes in pre-excitation that may suggest an accessory pathway. So many things to look out for. And I think there's also a mention about uh, 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 sometimes when you have a return beat, you're not sure whether there is an AV nodal echo or a junctional beat. A lot of, e a lot of times when we're doing EP study, we also want every uh, observation to be repeatable. So you always repeat the stimulation to double check whether this is a consistent finding. And if that's a consistent finding, then you're more inclined to believe one or the other. And I think you also touched on a very important last point, which is from the last few slides, when there is no, when there's a tachycardia without a one is to one relationship, an AVRT using an accessory pathway is likely to be eliminated. So thank you, thank you. So maybe we can uh, have a short Q&A. Dr. Pippin, you have any comments? Uh, uh, Ms. Liang, yes? Uh, uh, yes. Dr. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think there was a great talk delivered by Mr. Amir. And just please remember when we do the entrainment, uh, the more faster we deliver the pacing, it should, uh, it sometimes it will result in a pseudo AV response, especially in the patient with typical AV and Because when we do the pacing uh, quietly uh, fast compared to the SVT, Sometimes the uh, anti-grid conduction through the AV, his uh, bundle is quite prolonged. So the HP is much uh, prolonged compared to the HA. So the response will result in a VAAP. So that has been mentioned by Mr. Amir that when, we, when you do the uh, entrainment, uh, uh, you, we usually perform 20 to 30 milliseconds faster compared to the uh, SVT. If it is so fast, so we'll, we will see the result of the response uh, unlikely for the typical AP and RT. Uh, and my the comment is uh, by the using the ECG, I'm agree with the uh, Dr. Calvin. Sometimes we could see the retrograde uh, of the atrial activation through the ECG, just like the first slide of the Mr. Amir slide. We could see that there are uh, there was a, a pseudo S and the lead three. So we could analyze that at this ECG, there are the short RP interval. So the differential diagnosis of those ECG would be a typical AVNRT or 
uh, AT with prolonged uh, AV conduction. At the lead two, see, yeah, there, there was a, a pseudo S in the lead two, so it might be that the pseudo S is a retrograde T uh, through the AV node. So the differential diagnosis should be a, a typical AV NRT or AT with uh, prolonged uh, PR interval or prolonged uh, AV uh, conductions. That was my comment uh, for you, Mr. Amir. Yeah. Go to the Ms. Uh, Liang. Yeah, I, I really like that during the study, you emphasize on um, the conduction properties when we are doing the study. Because like when there's BAD, when you know that there's a tachycardia, will make it likely to be an AT. But if you suspect there's an even RT, then we should try to get um, consistent conduction. Yeah, and if it's uh, wacky marks super early, we know that by doing the study now, is very unlikely to get any tachycardia. So then we have to think about giving isoprel and all that. So um, taking note of what is happening during the study is really, really important. And I like that you emphasize on that. Um, so if no more question, let's go on to Mr. Wan. Wan, you- Actually, there was one question, uh, Ms. Supan. Oh, there is? Yeah. Which catheter do you use? Uh, I cannot find uh, HRA, HRA EGM. That's ah, okay. Yeah, I answered that question via the Q&A box. I think um, during most of Amir's study, uh, there was no HRA catheter used. Yeah, but, uh, okay. because you need just two punch it only. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so... Uh, um, hospital trilog and uh, eight French, uh, three for diagnostic catheter and one for ablation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So do we all actually don't really put in any IRA catheters in our yeah. lab. <laughs> I know we don't, yeah. But it um, makes it a bit difficult when it's the right side of the pathway, I think. Yeah, it, we tend to- just miss. have to be a bit more cognizant and careful. Yeah, that yeah. sometimes that may be a right side of pathway. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Wan. Yes. Your turn. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think this will be interesting. Can you see? Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna start. Uh, it's a great uh, honor and pleasure to present here. My name is Won Jung Jung, a radio technologist uh, from South Korea. I'm working at Samsung Medical Center EP lab. Uh, today's my topic is AVNRT with persistent left as we see. As you know, the persistent left as we see is the most common thoracic venous anomaly. The, the results of the persistent patency of an embryological M vessel known as left anterior cardinal vein it is usually drained into the right atrium through the coronary sinus. Uh, coronary sin so coronary sinus enlargements due to uh, volume overload and displacement of every node and his bundle and atrophy of the Bouchon valve and Abishan valve and the reduction of the left atrial size are the characteristic of the PLS we see. Case presentation, 35 years old female uh, she complained the recurrent palpitation. Uh, Transthoracic echocardiogram showed dilated coronary sinus. First, AVNRT ablation was failed. We do AVNRT ablation with 3D was successful. Yeah, TT showed uh, dilated coronary sinus in the parasternal long axis view here and tilted uh, apical port chamber view here. Baseline measurement was normal. Uh, decremental VA conduction was observed by uh, ventricular extra stimuli. Uh, it means the uh, VA conduction is through the AB node. And AH jump was uh, recorded by atrial extra stimuli. Uh, 
the it is the uh, uh, dual physiology, uh, every nodal physiology. Uh, continued atrial extra stimuli uh, induced the uh, narrow QRS tachycardia. The tachycardia showed uh, uh, simultaneous atrial ventricular uh, activation. It is highly suggestive of FNRT. So we to confirm the diagnosis, we uh, perform the differential pacing uh, during tachycardia. His bundle, uh, bundle uh, refractory PVC was delivered and uh, didn't uh, advance the retrograde activation. So it means uh, the axial pathway, pathway is absent. And we do uh, perform the ventricular overdrive pacing uh, for the entrainment. The atrial cycle length uh, was accelerated to the pacing cycle length. And the uh, post pacing response was VAV pattern, uh, indicating the AVNRT or AVRT, excluding AT. The post pacing interval minus tachy cycle length was over 150 five millisecond. So we finally diagnose this tachycardia as a uh, typical slow, fast FNRT. So we start the uh, ovulation uh, from the posterior septum area uh, where the usual slow pathway site uh, to the uh, mid posterior septum site. Uh, slow junctional rhythm was uh, observed at the uh, uh, posterior septum site and accelerated junctional rhythm, uh, which is successful uh, slow pathway ovulation, uh, was observed at the mid uh, septum, but tachycardia was uh, inducible still. So we uh, moved to uh, from the coronary sinus os to deep inside. A slow pathway potential was uh, recorded near the coronary sinus roof, like this. However, the uh, most serious things was uh, frequent transient every block, like this, and again. Yeah, so uh, we immediately stopped the uh, slow pathway mapping uh, and weights. And fortunately, the AV conduction was recovered soon, uh, but we uh, stopped the procedure. Uh, total procedure time was uh, around three hours, quite long, and there are many ablations were performed. So conventional slow pathway ovulation was failed because uh, dilated coronary, coronary sinus ostium due to uh, person to left SVC lead to atypical course of slow pathway and his bundle and difficulty to understand anatomical relationship between coronary sinus and core triangle would make insufficient contact of ovulation catheter to slow pathway site and frequent transient every block were occurred during slow pathway mapping. Lastly, the patient complained uh, prolonged procedure time. So we plan to use 3D electroanatomical system to identify coronary sinus morphology and the location of his bundle uh, for the safety uh, procedure. Several months later, the patient visit the epilum again and we uh, check the dual every nodal physiology with age jump. And the tachycardia was induced. Uh, we start to uh, set up the 3D mapping system. And 3D showed the uh, uh, giant coronary sinus ostiums. Uh, here's 36 millimeter. And uh, we can see the person to left SVC here. And we marked the uh, 
its bundle potential site with a yellow symbol. We ablate and the successful ablation site was uh, anterior side of mid coronary sinus os ostium, blue uh, symbols. Uh, the ablation was performed uh, without any concern of damage of AB node uh, because the site was uh, adequately distant from his bundle. So at that time, fluoroscopy, aerial view, and aerial view. Successful potential was here. Of course, the accelerate junctional rhythm was recorded at the successful site. We searched uh, several reports uh, related to our case. The, uh, from the Beijing in China, they said in every uh, NLT with uh, PLSVC, the most target site is in the anterior wall of the coronary sinus within one centimeter from the ostium, uh, blue symbol here. At that time, the exam showed uh, a little bit quite uh, bigger atrial potential than this. This site is usual slow pathway site posterior septum. So because the uh, successful site is a little bit uh, inside of coronary sinus ostium, that's why it's so a little bit uh, a large atrial uh, signal. Another report from the Korea, uh, they said in normal hearts, uh, the location of the slow pathway site is right posterior septum uh, between coronary sinus os uh, and uh, trichipid annulus. But however, uh, in person to left SVC patient, uh, the slow pathway uh, might be displaced to the uh, coronary sinus. So they said uh, it is especially important to map the roof area of the coronary sinus within post centimeter from the coronary sinus ostium. Lastly, uh, the, from the Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, they said uh, if the right side uh, approach is failed, uh, left side approach with transeptal puncture uh, could be an alternative option uh, for the slow pathway ablation. The catheter ablation is positioned like a left uh, posterior septum site and uh, especially targeting the uh, uh, small far field atrial potential and large ventricular potential uh, because the, in the photomicrography uh, of every junctional lesion, the every node site is here uh, and the left-sided uh, slow pathway input uh, likely located in the LV side then atrial side of uh, mitral annulus. So it's my summary. Uh, person to left SVC lead uh, coronary sinus enlargement and then displace the every node and his bundle. Therefore, there is a risk of every node damage resulting in every block when slow pathway ablation. If conventional ablation for slow pathway is failed, it could be helpful to use 3D mapping system for identifying anatomical relationship between coronary sinus morphology and code triangle. So it is possible to overlay safely and effectively at the distant site from his bundle. It is suggested that successful ablation site for every NLT with the person to left SVC is not only usual posterior septum site, but also the anterior wall or roof area of the coronary sinus. When right side approach failed, uh, left side approach with a transeptal puncture could be an alternative option for the slow pathway ablation. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Very Thank good. You. Um, maybe I can invite uh, any comments from the panelists. 
Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, there was some excellent explanation by Mr. Won. Uh, one short comment, when we dealing with the PLS species, sometimes when uh, assess the coronary sinus, especially if I had the jugular vein, it's quite hard comparing to the uh, assessing of coronary sinus from the femoral side. So in my institution, we usually we perform a jugular vein puncture to assess uh, the coronary sinus. So when the using that uh, approach, when we deal with the uh, engagement or catheter through the CS is quite hard, might be we are dealing it with the patient with the PLSVC. And that was true that one report from Brazil said that when ablation of patient with PLSVC is uh, failed at the conventional uh, mapping of the right side uh, of atria, we can do the puncture to uh, approach of the left side of the atria to mapping the uh, uh, slow pathway from the left atria and uh, from the Brazilian uh, uh, colleague said that that was uh, quite useful to map at that side. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Lab also, uh, if a right side failed uh, for the conventional uh, uh, ABNRT case, you uh, do the transeptal puncture for no, the no. left side? No, no. no especially uh, there was stated that in the Brazilian uh, journal said that after we knew that this is the PLSPC patient, we ablate uh, conventionally from the right-sided, maybe attempting uh, using the left-sided approach, it uh, gives some uh, better result. Mm, okay, thank you. Especially for the PLSVC patients. Mm. But in the non-PLSVC patient, usually uh, we just uh, engage our ablation catheter inside to the CS or beyond the CS, it will give a better result. Yes, right, right. Yes, I think that uh, those are very good comments. I, 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 like, I like the presentation in the, in, the, in the sense that in the beginning, uh, we showed an echo. I think it's also important that sometimes when we go into the case, we are prepared. When we, are, when we see actually a dilated coronary sinus on echo, we already know that most likely uh, there might be a persistent left side SVC. There must be some reasons why this uh, CS is dilated, like dilated. Sometimes we can even do an on-table venogram to confirm that. That makes us prepared for the procedure. And secondly, uh, uh, like what Dr. Pippin said, if you are prepared, then you are less likely to go through the right juggler for a CS. I don't know, some labs still use the IJ approach and then you're more likely to use a femoral approach for a CS. I think so. Number one, I think being prepared for the procedure is actually very important. Number two, and I, I, like, I like Mr. Wong who said that, uh, you know, when we have dilated CS, the triangle of cork is actually very compressed. If you imagine a triangle of cork at the top being the a compact bundle of his and the CS makes up the base of it with a dilated CS, the whole triangle is actually filled up with the CS os. So that makes the fast pathway or the, the, the uh, compact bundle of his quite close to where you might ablate. Yeah, mm. so that sometimes I saw a, a few slides or one slide that showed actually a pretty fast accelerated junctional rhythm and sometimes that may be a sign that we need to come off the ablation. Uh, 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 quickly. So uh, in these cases, I'll definitely use a 3D. And you, using the 3D, it allows me to actually uh, correctly or more accurately or precisely identify where the his signal is. And with the CS catheter there, you can even sometimes create a geometry of how big the CS cost is. That allows you to actually uh, map out the entire triangle of cork to target your ablation. And uh, uh, I also like the fact that we use mapping I can see from your activation map, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were, you, were, you were doing it in AVNRT, and that was the earliest retrograde atrial signal, which was marked red on your mapping. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I just want to caution also because the retrograde earliest atrial activation is usually just behind the fast pathway, at the, behind the tendon of Todaro, but that might not necessarily be the same as the anti-grade conduction. So we previously had studies before, the retrograde earliest A may not be the anti-grade A. So sometimes you may be mistaken and you feel that if you're away from that spot, you are safe. But sometimes that gives you a false assurance. 
And number two, I, I think the, the third point is, I think uh, it's very good to map inside the CS OS. A lot of times, as you rightly pointed out, with a dilated CS, the slow pathway is actually displaced. Sometimes where right. it displaces, we are not sure. And sometimes it might be a trial and error, but just be very wary that at the roof of the CS OS is the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anterior might be a best place to try first. Yeah. And sometimes there has been a lot of studies out there that are giving uh, atrial, uh, atrial premature ectopics to try and entrain the tachycardia and how easy for it to get into the tachycardia will give you an idea is of whether it is more likely to be left-sided, whether you're more likely to be successful on the left side or on the right side so that you want to continue mapping each side or decide to go transeptal or not. So those are my few points. Thank you, your comment. So um, I would just like to ask, was that ablation point look like, that your successful ablation spot look like where we might have usually ablate for slow pathway, right? Uh, uh, actually, the, uh, the slow pathway site was the, uh, near the coron uh, uh, loop of coron sinus. So, but uh, it was pent, no response. Uh, uh, so, yes, so uh, we, we moved to the, uh, the posterior septum and the, to the middle septum, so like a conventional uh, operation site like that. So, uh, especially it's uh, uh, dilated, in the dilated coronary sinus, so we uh, get a, a wide range of uh, mapping site we need so like uh, we need anatomical relationship so that's why we need a 3d uh, mapping system especially yeah very big wide range of uh, mapping site so yeah would it be actually the successful site yeah really would it be site. an overcall uh, asking the doctors here to use a contact force catheter in this case would it be a bit over to be using it? Uh, usually, it, when we uh, use the 3D mapping system, we use the, uh, the contact force uh, operation oh. catheter. Oh, always. Yeah, yeah, usually, yes, right. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, it really depends on the reimbursement scheme of each lab and hospital. Yes. I mean, if yeah. cost is not an issue, contact force is definitely useful, but I don't think it's essential to the case. If yes, I'm not right, wrong, right. all contact force catheters comes with irrigation. If I'm not wrong, I'm not, I'm not certain, but you have to be careful about an irrigated catheter ablating the slow pathway. You might want to turn off the irrigation, for example, to use it like a non-irrigated catheter and some of the technical issues. Yeah, for the safety, right? Yeah. So what we do in our lab is we would turn the flow to the slowest that we can. Yeah, if um, in this case, so for if you are using the smart blade machine, we would usually change the configuration back to the mocapper, but there will still be a maintenance flow of two mils per minute. Yeah, but if it's the ampere, we would change the flow to six mils during um, ablation and maintenance at two mils per minute. Okay. I think we have, Dr. Calvin, I think we have one more question. From what kind of ablation system would you use in this case? Cryo versus RF? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in this case, uh, 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 in this case, the, there are many frequent uh, AB blocks, uh, as you can see. So, so uh, the, the where is the his bundle potential? So, and uh, uh, the dilated colon sinus. So, our operation catheter is very uh, less, uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, very uh, moving with uh, very uh, 
so unstable, unstable of the operation catheter. So we need a uh, especially 3D system for the anatomical issue. So uh, the cryo is uh, not that good uh, option for this uh, case. Yeah, we, we need uh, uh, anatomical uh, uh, relationship is more important, I think. So I think as with all cases, and especially such a case, um, there's always a balance of uh, safety and efficacy. So you want to be safe, number one, and number two, you want to be effective, right? So I think when uh, uh, Mr. Wong pointed out, I think when there's a dilated CS, of course, sometimes there's a stability issue, right? And if there's a stability issue, you want to consider, uh, like what Ms. Liang mentioned, a contact force that allows you to know that you're actually having contact. You might want to consider using a shift as well that may help you achieve better contact. And I think when stability is an issue, sometimes uh, uh, I would say the cryo catheter may not be the best. Right, because it requires some time for you to stick and the ice to form before it's stable. And sometimes if you're not stable, there will, there will not be even ice forming. So uh, uh, the, the, the second issue is sometimes <clears throat> with cryo uh, uh, and if you have stability issues, the effectiveness is lost. So if you're if you okay to accept a maybe potential risk of recurrence, I think it's fine. But I think if a dilated, like dilated CS, you may even potentially require some form of irrigation if you're going to the left side to ablate. Yeah, so for effective uh, ablation, especially for a redo. So uh, unless it's a normal CS and you know that uh, there is really a risk and every time you come on this accelerated junction node and you know that it's the correct spot, there's no other spot, then that may be a, considering a switch to a cryo yeah. uh, ablation, but definitely yes, right. we will use a 3D mapping, yes. Mm. Yes, right. Additional comment, uh, when, when for mapping the slow pathway potential, I think uh, using the RFA uh, mapping is quite more easier and we use more effective when we dealing with patient with a slow pathway potential in this case, such as a PLSVC comparing using the cryo balance in the technical aspect. That's my comment uh, about the cryo and RFA. Okay, if there are no more um, questions, then we will. We have a little case study, then we have the audience to post for um, to see what they feel about this case. Okay. It's open to discussion. <laughs> so, Anybody can say anything. Um, so the this is the patient's 12 lead ECG, and uh, patient is a 20 year old male with history of palpitations but no documented tachycardia. Okay, any comments for the ECG? Uh, <laughs> Definitely <implement>. very excited. <laughs> RBW, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, uh, look at the first QRS complex. Uh, I think it's quite different compared to the other QRS complex. At the first QRS complex, uh, I'm suggesting that the disappearance of the potentials of delta wave comparing to the other QRS. So, ah, wow. You're really sharp. <laughs> <laughs> this one, right? Q yeah. Uh, I don't see any delta wave uh, at that uh, the first QRS complex. So it could be the intra-arterial conduction delay or delay in the delta wave or enhancement in the AV node conduction. We don't know because we don't see any RR interval before the first uh, QRS. So usually, um, I mean, as a tech, I would uh, try to see where the pathway is uh, in this case. And I am a bit lazy. So usually I would look at the V1 <laughs> to tell me whether it's the right side of the pathway or left side of the pathway. Um, yeah, at least I know the doctor would want to do a transeptal for this case, or we can just stay on the right side. So we can all agree it's a right, a left side of the pathway. Yep, then I'll go on. So 
what sort of tachycardia would you expect in this patient? Okay, let's get the audience to hold. Sorry, panelists, we can't. <laughs> we can choose the, your, your choice in your heart. We have uh, 30 seconds for them. Okay. Oh, okay. Most people say they would be expecting an AVRT. Okay. So. I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with expecting that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do you think sometimes before we start a procedure, should we have some sort of expectations what, <laughs> what we should be seeing or we should keep our minds open for anything that might come? Both, actually. You expect something, but still keep an open-minded uh, approach. <laughs> okay, so this is the um, graduate pacing. And we can see here from Mr. Amil's uh, lecture, the CS is um, eccentric, the atrial activation. So, oh, I just like to point out just now for Mr. Wan, actually you realize his CS is um, placed in the opposite way. So when, you're, when we are looking at the electrograms, we really should look at the labels to make sure that is um, what we are seeing is what we are labeled. Because in his case, we might have thought the CS is eccentric, but actually because it's labeled the other way around. Yeah, so this is what we expect. Retrogridely is also eccentric. So for this patient, we probably want to look to see how fast antigridly the pathway also conducts, um, whether the patient is at risk for sudden cardiac death, if the patient goes into AF. And you can see antigridly, uh, during maximum lift pre-excited is really quite fast. So um, we would have ablated this pathway even if the patient does not have any tachycardia. Yep. Okay. So as we go on to do integrate pacing, this is what we see. Okay. Any comments? Or should I let the audience poll first? Yeah, I think we should poll. Okay. Did we, did we emphasize it's the same patient, right? Oh, yes. It's the same patient for today. <laughs> we are doing the EP now. <laughs> okay, so at least nobody thinks it's VT. Um, Autodromic AVRT, we have 33%. A mix between AT with bystander, AVNRT AV with bystander, and... Some say we need to do more maneuvers. What about the panelists? Uh, okay. Can I give some comment? Uh, go back to the first uh, uh, induction, uh, Ms. Liang Sufen. Yep. Yep, yeah. Uh, here we can see that after the S2 pacing, the CS propagation is still the same as the S1 pacing. Uh, so, Actually, at this time, after the last pacing, the bypass track is uh, activated simultaneously between the 
uh, I mean, ventricle is activated simultaneously from the AV junction normally and then the bypass tract. So from this uh, tracing, I'm suggesting the uh, orthodromic AVRT is less unlikely. Uh, I mean, is unlikely because uh, in orthodromic AVRT, we could uh, analyze that during the S2, the bypass tract is blocked. But in here, the during the S2, the bypass tract is still activated. So uh, the orthodromic uh, FVRT is unlikely. That was my opinion. So after that, the tachycardia induced, we could see that the hististal, see at the hististal, uh, comparing to the V at the CS, it seems that the V activation at the CS is quite a uh, little late compared to the His. So my... Comparing at the his uh, at the his distal compared to the V at the CS12, I'm suggesting that the his is uh, earlier compared to the V at the CS. In in other tracing at the first pacing bit, we can see that the his is embedded inside the V at the CS. So at this tracing might be that this is the induction of AT with. Uh, bystander or AVNRT with bystander AP as the uh, integrate uh, conduction to the fee. What if somebody argues that why is this not um, ART? Antidromic tachycardia, since anti-greatly is, um, is eccentric. During the tachycardia, if not missed, uh, is it uh, his right, his deflection right, in the, his distal? Yeah, so yeah. And the and it's is a little small, but maybe, Miss Liang, you want to point out the his at the last three beats? I think there's a, a little bit on the small side, yes, but I think we can make out a his signal on the distal. Yeah. So the his with a part uh, what do I call this? With uh, a his with uh, fusion of the um, pre excitation would tell us this is not a antidromic tachycardia. Okay, so um, yeah, of course, I think we should do more maneuvers, although we can already get clues from the electrogram. Yeah, but more maneuvers is always good. <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately, good. the tachycardia. Always good. Always good yeah, it's good. Yeah, but unfortunately, it actually terminated before you can do anything. So Maybe I want to emphasize a point that whenever you have a positive HV, it looks like a positive HV, maybe it's on the shorter yeah. side, yeah. but whenever you have a positive HV, it is very unlikely to be ART, right? In RT, you have to come down the accessory pathway, activate the V first, then the HIS. Yes. Right. Most likely you get a negative HV. Just a point to make. Okay. So of course the tachycardia terminated. So we want to get it back again. So here we are doing induction by pacing a short burst of atrial beats. And this is the tachycardia that now we have. So you can see now the atrial activation is very different. And I think this is the his a very far few his here. So I can give you a comparison of the first techie that we have and this techie. So the atrial activation is very, very different. And we can see here that uh, we have lost the pre-excitation on the ECG. So, oh, <laughs> I think I worry that we do not have enough time. So here, yeah, we have done our maneuvers for you doctors. Can I see the previous slide again? I think it's very important that the audience notice the change in the QRS. Just notice in V1, please. The V1 on the right-sided image, there is a slurring and it's a bit of an R wave in V1, which is 
not present or very, very marginalized on the left side of the screen. So that is on the right side, there is some change in the QRS and judging by the looks of this case, it is likely that the right-sided uh, 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 electrogram is pre-excited. I just want to point that out. And even though the ECG, there's this uh, subtle difference, you can see uh, intracardiacly, the EGM is actually very, very different. So, okay, we do our pacing maneuvers. Actually, ventricle overdrive pacing is one of my favorite <laughs> pacing maneuver because I think it really um, help you eliminate some of the tachycardia and it, you can come to a conclusion, get a lot of information from this. So any comments? There's no poll. Um, let's see the next one. Yeah, we do. <laughs> You can comment without giving away the answer, probably. <laughs> maybe, so we if... ask, maybe we ask Mr. Wong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I also uh, really love the to, uh, entrainment ventricular overdrive pacing, like you, Shupen. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, uh, we need to uh, uh, correct the PPI minus tachycycle length measure, right? Yep. Uh, well, I like that um, the atrial activation is the same. So it does tell us something. Yeah. And I'm sorry I didn't measure this for you, but I think it's PPI is short. So do you usually correct for the AH interval when you do this? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, especially like this eccentric uh, activation. Uh, actually, uh, I think we don't need uh, entry. So, uh, but uh, Mm, if we do that, uh, uh, the conventional PPI minus uh, tachycycline length was uh, uh, sometimes not correct. So uh, uh, corrected PPI minus tachycycline length is very useful, I think. So yeah, the, this situation, uh, PPI was a little bit long. Uh, compared to Taki's ankle length. So we can uh, misunderstand it. So mm. we need to correct the PPA minus Taki's ankle length. Okay, so the audience, 57% hold that this is a autodromic AVRT, which is correct. So Mr. Amir's lectures have helped a lot, I think. Okay, so autodromic AVRT. So where would you ablate in this case? Okay, 78%. There's some people who say they might want to ablate the slow pathway first. Would you still, um, any of our doctors? Uh, yes, uh, from this case, we would see that there are two different tachycardia in this patient. The, the, the second tachycardia, I am agree that this one is a uh, 
orthodromic using the left-sided accessory part bay. But the first tachycardi, uh, we don't have any conclusion about the first tachycardi. So might be uh, the first thing to do is the ablate of the left-sided accessory part bay first and then try to induce the the first tachycardia is it inducible or not and if it, and if it is inducible so we can do the other uh, maneuver to uh, differentiate i agree uh, honestly i was not very convinced i think i wanted to see the measurements better because that last entrainment that ppi seemed a bit long to me i would measure it and i will even correct it for the ah prolongation and secondly, uh, uh, the VA time seems quite different. I need to measure that also. So I think I wanted to talk, maybe bring out a few points about this entrainment maneuvers. Of course, we understand this audience needs to know that we need to make sure we entrain because the first AA cycle length on this slide seems a bit different. So I don't know when we started entraining it. Yeah, that interval looks a bit long to me. And maybe we only entrain it after the third beat. I'm, I'm, so we need to measure, that's number one, to make sure we entrained to be able to interpret this. And if we think that it's interpretable, that's based on entrainment as well as a similar or identical return atrial activation, then we can interpret this uh, uh, VOD, right? Ventricular overdrive pacing. So once we have demonstrated entrainment, then we should look at the response. But we also typically call this a VAV response or more accurately VAHV response. There's a hiss, which is very nicely pointed out. And number three, there are many different ways to look at it. Sometimes you look at the PPI. This PPI looks a bit long to me, I'm not sure. Yeah, but there is also AH prolongation. So it's difficult to tell. We need to really correct that to be sure. And number four, I think, the VA time during entrainment, which is the V pacing, and uh, during tachycardia is a bit different. So I'm not sure. I'm just saying I'm not sure whether there is an accessory pathway. I'm just not convinced that it is participatory. I might do even more maneuvers, but this is just me. So in the end, we did ablate the left side of the street pathway first. And then here you can see, um, we were quite on the spot, managed to get it um, within two beats, I think less than one or two seconds of the ablation. And subsequently, we try to induce the tachycardia again. And this is what we get. So does this confirm your suspicion so when we see this tachycardia what would be what would come to your mind now for me the choice would probably be at and atypical even rt mm. yeah so, so we need the entry <laughs> <laughs> entry <laughs> I mean, it could still be AT, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Mr. Wan, for your left-sided SBC case, I've never actually had an ABNRT with a left side of SBC. But I actually have a left free wall pathway with a left sided SBC with um, CS a tree here. That means there's no CS on. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, oh, actually, a lot of the audience poll. 80, it's an 80, but um, almost an equal number said that we should do more maneuvers. Okay, so did I do any? So here, okay, I'm being lazy here. I'm only making sure that AA is entrained actually. 
Thank you. Any comment from our uh, doctors and techs? That, that's a crucial measurement. That means that uh, the immediate A, that means uh, one, two, three, the third A that follows the V pacing belongs to the pacing spike before. And one, two, three, four, the fourth atrial signal on the CS belongs to the last ventricular pacing stimulus. So this is commonly what people would call a VA, a V response. But if you see that it belongs to the last pacing stimulus, this is a pseudo VAAV response. I think that's what Ms. Liang is trying to show. Maybe you want to explain a little bit more? Yeah, so those that who have pulled for atrial tachy by doing this maneuver, it, and if they didn't measure just by looking at the response, they might have concluded thinking that it really is atrial tachycardia. But so uh, it's, I'm really trying to emphasize, we really, really have to make sure the AA is the same as your pacing interval whenever you do this maneuver. Any other comments? If no, I will go on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. We have to let the audience work a bit. Actually, the panelists can vote now. It's very nice. Oh, we can? Oh, we can. Okay. Oops, there are people who are not convinced that it's avian <laughs> So we have a equal split between AT and avian RT. And um, there are people who want to do more maneuvers. But at this point, um, is it more or less confirmed for the doctors that this is avian RT? Yeah, do you want to take another two minutes to explain on the last slide again? Maybe Dr. Pippin, you want to maybe yep. spend some time to explain that again? Can you show the last slide of the entrainment, please? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think when we entrain using the RP of ventricle of drive pacing, we should analyze whether the A is following the V of a drive pacing. Here we can see that actually the last Pace or the ventricular of the drive pacing is not the first A after the pacing. It actually the last A that follows the last pace is the second uh, A after the last pace. So just like what Dr. Kelvin said that it was named as the pseudo VAAV. And sometimes when we see uh, this phenomenon, just like uh, pseudo VAV, it's falsely to the diagnostic of atrial tachycardia, but actually this is the uh, non-diagnostic for the AT. And the second, whether the question is, is it AVNRT or AVRT using septal or right-sided uh, AP? We could analyze that from the ventricular overdrive passing and the tachycardia cycle length. We all knew that the AVNRT, the A and V, is uh, simultaneously uh, activated compared to the A, V, or T, where the A and V is activated in parallel. So when we doing the ventricular overdrive passing, uh, we are trying to analyze the distance between the stem to the A minus to the V to the A of the tachycardia cycle length. If it is different, uh, if this difference or the distance between those two are quite uh, long, so it is a diagnostic 
for the AV energy. Here we can see that the steam, plus steam, to the last A, compared to the V of the tachycardia to the A in the tachycardia, is quite uh, long, the difference between those two. So it should be false in the diagnostic rule in for uh, AV NRT, a typical AV NRT. That was my comment. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> I will just end this. I don't want to hold everybody. Um, so these are the tachycardia that we have seen in this patient. Um, if you are T with a uh, bystander left free wall or uh, accessory pathway, um, autodromic AVRT utilizing the left free wall accessory pathway and uh, atypical fast flow giving RT. And of course, subsequently, we did ablate the slow pathway and so far patient is symptom free. Okay, that's all. So I'm glad that uh, we had a very nice discussion. Any more comments? <laughs> if not, then we can end this session. Thank you all for uh, joining us on a Saturday and then have a nice weekend. We see you next session. Yep, thank you.